Welcome to the Digital Edge with Sharon Nelson and Jim Calloway. Your hosts, both legal technologists, authors, and lecturers, invite industry professionals to discuss a new topic related to lawyers and technology. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to the 150th edition of the Digital Edge Lawyers and Technology. We're glad to have you with us. I'm Sharon Nelson, President of Sensei Enterprises, an information technology, cybersecurity, and digital forensics firm in Fairfax, Virginia. And I'm Jim Calloway, Director of the Oklahoma Bar Association's Management Assistance Program. Today, our topic is a legal podcast about legal podcasting. But first, thanks to our sponsor, Clio. Check out Clio's Daily Matters podcast for the latest on legal in the COVID-19 era. Listen to Daily Matters at clio.com forward slash daily or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We would like to thank Alert Communications for sponsoring this episode. If any law firm is looking for a call, intake, or retainer services, Available 24-7-365, 365 just call 866-827-5568. We'd also like to thank our sponsor, the Black Letter Podcast, a show dedicated to making law exciting and fun with informative interviews and advice from esteemed guests. Thanks to Scorpion. Scorpion is the legal provider of marketing solutions for the legal industry. With nearly 20 years of experience serving attorneys, Scorpion can help you grow your practice. Learn more at scorpionlegal.com. Well, Sharon, 150 monthly Digital Edge podcast. That's a lot by anybody's measurement, 12 plus years. So we want to do something a little special for number 150. And after we reflected on that, we decided that we would reach out to some veteran legal podcasters we know to discuss a range of topics related to podcasts by lawyers and for lawyers. Well, I'm thrilled to be at this anniversary podcast. That's great. And we, we were really pleased that we got this lineup of seasoned and celebrity professionals. So we do have an all-star panel today. Many of our listeners are familiar with most or all of these experts. So I am pleased to first introduce Bob Ambrosi, who is a lawyer and journalist who has been writing and speaking about legal technology and innovation for more than two decades. He writes the award-winning blog, Law Sites, is a columnist for for Above the Law, hosts the podcast about legal innovation, Law Next, and hosts the weekly news podcast, Legal Tech Week. In 2011, Bob was named to the inaugural Fast Case 50, honoring the law's smartest, most courageous innovators, techies, visionaries, and leaders. In 2017, he received the Yankee Quill Award for Journalism from the Academy of New England Journalists and was honored by the ABA Journal as a Legal Rebels Trail. Blazer. Thanks for joining us today, Bob. Thank you for having me, and, and congratulations on this uh, momentous milestone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and next we have Joe Patrice. Since 2013, Joe Patrice has been mocking lawyers for their own good at Above the Law, <laughs> an NYU School of Law grad with stints at Cleary Gottlieb and Lanker Stiflin Wolf. Joe left the exciting world of white-collar defense to provide a dose of humor to America's legal news coverage. In addition to covering lawyers, law firms, and the legal academy, Joe follows the legal tech field, watching Luddite attorneys have the daily epiphany that there just might be a better way to do all this. He hosts the podcast, Thinking Like a Lawyer, which began in 2015 and is hosted by the Legal Talk Network. Thanks for joining us today, Joe. Thanks for having me. This is great. And last but certainly not least, Tom Mile, who is currently Vice President of Delivery at Contural, where he helps companies develop comprehensive programs for managing records and information. Tom is a frequent speaker and writer on technology. His current book is The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together. Tom served as the chair of two ABA tech shows in 2008 and co-chair in 2018, and he served as chair of the ABA's Law Practice Division in 2011. And of course, he is a podcaster. His podcast, The Kennedy Mile Report, was first broadcast in 2006. Thank you for joining us today, Tom. Well, thank you, Sharon. It's great to be here. And congratulations to both of you on your sesquicentennial podcast. <laughs> I couldn't even say that word. Thank you. <laughs> 
Well, let me start with Bob. Bob, we've seen what feels like a podcast renaissance with many podcasts, some hosted by celebrities gaining national attention. Today, we're going to focus on podcasts hosted by lawyers or targeted for lawyers. So didn't you co-host one of the earliest legal podcasts, Lawyer to Lawyer? And and if you if you I, I know the answer is yes. So, so, so. <laughs> get that out of the way. Let's Never ask a question you don't know the answer to. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> can, can you tell us about those early legal podcasts and share a favorite story? <laughs> so yes, I did. As a matter of fact, host the <laughs> earliest legal podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer. Uh, you know that was actually the first Legal Talk Network podcast, uh, and we launched that. Our first episode was on August thirty first of two thousand and five. Just not not all that much longer before you guys uh, got started with yours. But you know that was a, a really interesting time. We were doing a weekly show for a long time. Uh, I left it a couple of years ago uh, and started my other uh, podcast, Law, Law Next, that I do now. But but not not to uh, make little of your 150 shows, but by, by my ep- estimate, I did about 600 episodes of that show before we <laughs> before I walked away from it. And Craig is still doing it. Craig Williams, who was uh, the partner on it. But, uh, you know, I think I really think the the interesting thing was just in the early days, nobody had any idea what a podcast was. The very first show we did, one of our guests was Mike Greco, who had just taken office that year as president of the American Bar Association. And I knew Mike because uh, he's a Boston uh, lawyer, but he, I'm sure he had no idea what was going on. I, I think he just thought he was on a radio show of some kind. And, uh, <laughs> you know, but he was, he was good and he was gracious and it, it all worked out well. It certainly did. You, you've been a podcaster for so very long. What what revs you up still about podcasts? And have you thought about retiring at any point? The, the correct answer to that last part is, <laughs> I hope, a resounding no. <laughs> yeah, no, I really love podcasting. And uh, I, I don't see myself giving it up at any time. I, I just love the opportunity to sit and have you know, one-on-one conversations with interesting people. And it's always just a lot of fun. I, lately, I've been doing, uh, and, and Joe can attest to this because he's involved with one of them, but lately we've been doing some that where we're doing both video and audio or kind of recording it as a as a live event with a live audience and, and then also putting it out as a podcast. So that's kind of a variation on it, but uh, it's a lot of fun. Joe, I want to discuss the impact of being a podcast host on the host. Do you know any uh, stories you'd like to share of somebody who got a great job or an important appointment or met their true love because of their podcasting? (laughs) You know, I wish I could say that uh, that's that. Well, I mean, one of these days it's going to turn around for me, and I'm going to get that <laughs> get that high flying job out of it. No, um, that's not totally true. I mean, the, the podcasting, I think, has a there's a personality to it that you can't quite get just across the page, and adding that to our media outreach at Above the Law, at least, has been a huge benefit. Uh, It allows people to have a little bit more of a personal connection with us. And I think it's not unfair to say that even though they don't have a podcast, my partner on Thinking Like a Lawyer for the last several years, Ellie Mistal, has now left Above the Law because he got a job being a featured columnist with the nation, which was a huge step up in the media universe for him. And a lot of that has to do with, had to do with his, his kind of ubiquitous presence, uh, and being in the media more than just his own writing. Not that, you know, not that I don't want to sound like I'm knocking him as a writer. He's a great writer, but, but, you know, having that personal connection is huge. And I think we've seen that a lot with people who have, podcasts in all manner of places. I'm not me per se, but I know that I am a huge podcast fan and I've certainly heard over the years of podcasts that I follow people who now have books that they got published because a publisher reached out to them and they've moved on to be- bigger and better jobs. And so it definitely is valuable because it helps you build that connection. Joe, how's podcasting changed over time? And do you think podcasts are appealing as ever or or are growing in appeal? That's kind of what I think. But what do you think? Yeah, I think the podcast has definitely changed. I think early on, like a lot of technologies, and, you know, hey, this 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 ties us back to being a technology-focused uh, podcast. Like a lot of technologies, it began trying to emulate something that existed in the pre-podcasting world. I mean, it started out as radio shows, but on your iPod. As time has gone on, I think people have learned to play with that format a lot more. Uh, You see different genres of podcasts, but also different formats. 
ideas like serial, which was everything to everybody a few years ago, like that's the kind of programming that I don't think you saw in the early days of podcasting, but the realization that you could utilize it as something of a long form to tell a story over time was the sort of natural evolution of this of this medium. And I definitely think it's grown in appeal as people are finding different ways to entertain themselves with these different genres. And I also think there's not a lot to do right now, right? So uh, you're sitting at home. Uh, this, is a, this is a thing to do to kill some time. I love that answer. <laughs> I mean, what, what else are you going to do? Although I, I will be honest, I thought podcasting might suffer a dip through this because I worried, like, I, I don't know about all the rest of you, I listen to podcasts a lot while I commute. And right. that is a thing that mm-hmm. the moving from my bedroom to my living room is no longer a long enough commute to get through an episode. <laughs> and, <laughs> but uh, the statistics that I've seen so far suggest that's not true, that people are really listening more. They, they did dip briefly, like when this was first starting, like the end of March, a little bit into early April, they dipped a bit, but then it just picked up and I think more people yeah. are listening than ever. Well, at least they're you know they can listen while they exercise if they if they do exercise. No right. exercise. Uh, <laughs> yeah, highly overrated. I know, uh, but they are going out and walking things like that. So mm-hmm. I, I think there is some podcast listening going on. Tom, let me ask you. You and you and Dennis Kennedy have hosted uh, the Kennedy Mile Report, which has been on forever too, and which I think everybody must know. But it says on my script that it's a legal technology podcast. But I think everybody yes. knows that. We, we you know. So many people are kind of nervous about starting their own podcast. They have a lot of idea that there's no way they could undertake such a thing. Would you have any advice or tips for listeners considering starting a podcast of their own? I think this question kind of flows nicely from Joe's last answer, because I don't know how many of you have seen the, this video from an Australian group. And the message is the video is called A Message to Australians During COVID-19. And I'm going to paraphrase a little bit of it. It says, we know things are hard right now, but now more than ever, it's time to think about how your choices affect others. So please, please, please don't start a podcast. (laughs) Just don't do it. You might feel like it's a productive use of your time right now. You've probably already got a USB mic and a spare room ready to go. And your friend Dave's got some interesting opinions, but we're here to tell you he doesn't. And so that's my first advice. Don't start a podcast just because everybody else is, or because you've got some spare time, or because you read an article or heard another podcast saying it's a good way to promote your practice or your business. It's the same reason why you don't want to just go and start a blog. Make sure that one, you've got a specific topic or a niche that you want to cover. Two, you know there's an audience out there who's interested in what you have to say. That's really important these days because there are so many podcasts. Um, And three, that you've got the stamina to go the distance. It's one thing to try it out two or three times and decide it's not for you. It's another to get an audience that comes to rely on you and then you suddenly abandon them after a year or half a year or whatever it is. Second piece of advice, invest in good quality equipment, a good microphone, good software, know how to use all of it. There's not much worse these days than a podcast that sounds like the host is talking into a speakerphone, and there are a lot of those out there. And then third, I think if you're doing this on your own, we are all very fortunate to have producers or people who make us sound good and work very hard on the on editing and producing a podcast. But if you're doing this on your own, you either need to learn how to edit and produce it or hire somebody with the knowledge to help you. You know, sites like Upwork, you can find people with audio experience that you can hire on a per podcast basis at pretty reasonable prices. So that might be an option for you as well. But I think that, you know, those are three main things that I would think about if starting a podcast is in the cards for you. Well, that's all great advice. One of the things I wondered is it seems to me almost every venture has some sort of secret sauce. What do you regard as the secret sauce of podcasting? So I don't know that this is secret, but to me, it's <laughs> it's important sauce. So I'll say that to me, one of the most important things about podcasting is preparation, but making it look like you haven't prepared. Don't just wing it. It's painful to hear people who obviously just turned the microphone on and started talking. Some people are good at it. Not everybody is. Don't assume that you're good at doing that. Plan out what you want to say, whether it's a full-blown script, whether it's an outline of your talking points. That way you won't mess up. You won't forget anything. You're not going to stumble around trying to figure out what to say. You have a ground. You have an anchor. 
The hard part of that, however, is making it sound like you're not using a script, making it sound like you're not reading from prepared materials, because ultimately you want your podcast to sound like you are having a conversation, like you are just talking to the audience and it, make it sound as natural as possible. So I think that's kind of the, 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 the real secret to having a good podcast is being prepared to talk about what you need to talk about, but doing so in a way that sounds like you're just saying it right off the tip of your tongue. I would say about that, that it, from my perspective, I always treated it a lot like depositions. Like, mm -hmm. you know what you want. You have some things prepared as far as questions that you know are, are stock questions. But then you also recognize that they're going to say something that's going to change how you go about it and being flexible, being knowledgeable enough to be flexible. And to go down a different path. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's a perfect description. That is great. And before we move on to our next segment, let's take a quick commercial break. As the largest legal-only call center in the U.S., Alert Communications helps law firms and legal marketing agencies with new client intake. Alert captures and responds to all leads 24-7, 365 as an extension of your firm in both English and Spanish. Alert uses proven intake methods, customizing responses as needed, which earns the trust of clients and improves client retention. To find out how Alert can help your law office, call 866-827-5568 or visit alertcommunications.com forward slash LTN. The Black Letter Podcast demystifies complicated law and business issues by breaking them down into simple, understandable bites. Hosted by Tom Dunlap of Dunlap, Bennett and Ludwig, this show features fun and informative conversation with esteemed guests like CEOs and former AGs of the CIA. You can listen to Black Letter today on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to the Digital Edge on the Legal Talk Network. Today, our subject is a legal podcast about legal podcasting. Our guests are veteran podcasters Bob Ambrosi, Joe Patrice, and Tom Mile. Bob, as a career journalist, you've heard many interesting stories from lawyers in the legal technology community for a long time. So in the interest of some objective treatment of this subject, because uh, we're all kind of pro-podcast here, <laughs> have you heard any podcasting horror stories that you could share for us? <laughs> Well, I, I'm not sure what you mean by horror story, but I, I had one recently that was that I considered to be a horror story. Now you're I, talking I about the show I was on again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't ever have Joe Patrice on your podcast, <laughs> or at least do it well before happy hour. That's all I can tell you. Uh, no, no, it was not that one. Actually, it was one in which I had. Um, Justice Dino Homonis is a Utah Supreme Court justice uh, who's been uh, a leader in, in bringing about uh, regulatory reform efforts in, in Utah. And this was back in October when the Supreme Court of Utah had just kind of ordered this reform, these uh, reforms. And I, I had him and uh, John Lund, who's the president of the Utah Bar, and at that point, Justice Homonis was was in the courthouse, uh, had a, a lot of difficulty kind of getting the recording session going. Uh, what was supposed to be a, roughly a half an hour recording ended up taking us taking about almost two hours, I think, because he had to get a tech person in to get the the recording working and, and this and that. And it was quite a quite a thing. But then we ended up having just a great, a great conversation. And that night, my son, who helps me with the production on my podcast, he was in the middle of moving his, his apartment. And so as a result of that, he had not properly backed up the recording. He had it on his computer, uh. but he didn't have a backup of it. <laughs> and he was uh, in the middle of moving in San Francisco, and his car got broken into, and his computer got stolen. And uh. with it went the recording of Justice Amonis and, <laughs> and John Lund. And uh, so uh, I, 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 we kind of hunted around to see if there was some between my own local recording and some other stuff we could we could reconstruct it, but we decided we couldn't. And so I very sheepishly went back to Justice Simonis and said, never in my 15 years have I ever done this before. And I've certainly never done it to a Supreme Court justice, but I'm wondering if I could get you to re-record <laughs> that episode. <laughs> and he was totally gracious about it. We hopped back on and, and got the show. And that was that was a very embarrassing horror story. <laughs> yes, it was. We will I never not have a backup that. again, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure it was a fun father-son conversation, too, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, uh, as we all know, 
the topics and guests are always a challenge. How do you come up with the best topics and guests, both of which are absolutely critical to the podcasting enterprise? Well, Jim, if I told you that, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, you know, I, I try to, I, for, for the current show I do now, Law ne- Next, I, I, I'm really just trying to t- tie it to uh, stories in the news in some ways. People who are uh, perhaps making the news. I mean, I really focus on on innovation and technology and law. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm watching the news anyway for my blog, and and I'm always thinking about who would make a good interview about something. And I mean, just today I, I interviewed uh, Rebecca Sandifer, who's a sociologist who studies access to justice. But the the hook for me was that last week there was an announcement about the end of the limited license legal technician program uh, mm-hmm. in, in Washington State. And, and Rebecca had written and studied that program. So I thought, well, she'd be a great person to get on and talk about it. So it's really just that. I, I will say that when I was involved with the Legal Talk Network for all those years, I had a lot of help, uh, particularly from Kate Nutting, who was our producer for almost the entirety of all the years we did that show. And, and Kate would, was great at suggesting guests and suggesting topics and, and helping to line up the guests. So that was a real team effort there. Well, you've certainly done a great job. That's, that's for sure. So what, what, however you manage it, you managed it well indeed. Joe, I'm thinking that being a legal editor at Above the Law might have given you a leg up on the rest of us in terms of ideas. What, what's the interplay between your job at Above the Law and your podcast? That I do two full-time jobs without getting paid enough is what the interplay <laughs> is. Um, no, um, it, it, it is interesting. Um, so we have multiple podcast outlets, really. I mean, thinking like Lawyer is just one of the ones that we do through Above the Law. And it's great because we have all sorts of ideas. Not only are there guests coming to us because we have a you know a pretty big footprint in the legal world, and we have columnists like Bob, who are, you know, I'll give us cachet with lots of big players who want to be on the show. But we also, because we're your daily repository of lawyer got caught with his pants down <laughs> stories, we have a lot of things to just talk about in the news. It's a nice way for us because only one person can write a story. So when you get one of those really nice, juicy, embarrass, lawyer embarrasses themselves stories, Somebody else wrote it, and you kind of want to take your crack at uh, making a few jokes about it. You get the opportunity on the podcast. Uh, And so we try to mix in a nice and maybe not always perfect balance of the I'm going to talk to, you know, an executive from LexisNexis about their latest offering and then play it off into now we're going to talk about a disciplinary committee uh, hearing that's really funny. Uh, So it's... From episode to episode, it's kind of an adventure what you're going to get. But that's how we utilize our platform to get our guests and so and topics for the show. Well, I've, I like those misadventure stories. Those are, those are mean, fun. <laughs> that's the bread and butter, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's why they all know above the law. Uh, so, Joe, I've, I've got a two-part question here. Does the podcasting okay. format give you a chance to say whatever you want about anything that interests you? And is it a lot more fun than being a practicing attorney? Well, it definitely gives us the ability to say whatever we want, which is uh, my Legal Talk Network colleagues will see, will note that, yes, it gives him the ability to talk about what he wants, which is why it's the only legal podcast with the explicit tag. Uh, but, <laughs> but beyond that, yeah, no, it's, it's a huge freedom. Uh, not that above the law, in fairness, above the law gives me a, a good deal of freedom too. So I, I don't know as though podcasting gave me unique freedom as much as the above the law branding did. But it is definitely a lot more fun than being a practicing attorney. Uh, I did that for over a decade. And uh, while I certainly enjoyed the law in its ways, you know, I mean, I did a lot of criminal defense work and uh, for white collar clients, and my people tended not to be people who were going to go to jail, but they were nonetheless people that you know you were always nervous about. And <laughs> deep down, I con- I I cared just a little too much, and so I was always nervous about the. I would often represent, say, like a, a secretary of an executive who was a witness in something, and I was always nervous that like this poor person who has no idea what they were mixed up in could go to go to jail. And I was like, ah, that's terrible. But now. Now I can just make fun of people all the time. 
That's so liberating. <laughs> you, you went from secondary trauma to enjoying the comedy of life. Huh? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, well, it, tra- trauma is always the best entree to being funny, right? So that's what all those movies and operas and everything are about. So yeah, that's what I. That's what I've done. Well, moving back to Tom Mile, Tom, you and Dennis have been podcasting together for a very long time. So let's talk about the uh, upsides to having a partner. And we know Dennis probably won't listen. So are there any downsides to having a partner? <laughs> so you, what's funny is Dennis Dennis sent me um, a link to your blog, Jim, from April 16th of 2006, where you were announcing the first edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, which was broadcast on ABA Tech Show. So that's how I knew it was 2006, because uh, you reported on it first. Um, I think that the the biggest upside of having a partner is having somebody to talk to. I mean, especially if you don't have guests uh, on your podcast. I think it's hard to do a podcast where it's just you talking, where it's just you saying things no matter what the topic is, no matter how funny or smart or insightful you happen to be. If you don't have anybody to react to what you're saying, nobody to bounce your thoughts off of, I think that's... That would mentally be so exhausting for me. I, I think having a, a partner is a good thing to do. Having a co-host or host allows for that interactivity when it makes sense, that conversational style when you're able to do it. I just think it makes for a, a better mix. Another upside is obviously that you can divide and conquer on responsibilities. You know, Dennis and I collaborate on the script. He drafts the first pass. I fill it in refine. I know Jim and Sharon, that probably isn't a lot different for you, but we, we're bouncing ideas off each other all the time. And I think that helps to make for better content. If we talk about downsides, I would say that a downside is you don't always get to do what you want if you have a partner. Sometimes your co-host is hesitant to have guests on the show when you really want to talk to some guests. Uh, Sometimes you want to talk about topics that your co-host isn't interested in. I'm not going to say that applies to any podcast in particular or podcast (laughs) co-host in particular. But I will say like any relationship, it's a give and take, and it's just part of what uh, part of what uh, the relationship is like. So uh, I, I would say that it, the benefits far outweigh the disadvantages. Well, Tom, what are the elements that make your podcast so successful, and and are they things that you can tell uh, other podcasting people of interest in hosting to uh, emulate? You know, when I saw this question, I really was like, "What is what, how?" Because I think that success is a matter of interpretation, and and I don't necessarily think that our podcast is so successful. But here are ways in which I think that if somebody was to say it was, here here are two things that I think that make it that way. First, we choose topics that we genuinely enjoy talking about. It's not going to necessarily be something that our audience wants to hear, and maybe that may contribute to why we not may not be as successful, but we really do find things that we enjoy talking about, we could talk about for a long time, which we wind up doing more often than not, and we enjoy learning those aspects of the topic that we might not learn so well. So doing the research and finding out more about the stuff we're gonna talk about is enjoyable to us, that's a benefit. Secondly, I think we both have this, I would call it a bizarre tendency to agree on almost everything. There are times where I'd like to have more give and take, where I'd like for there to be, well, I'm not sure I agree with you, Dennis, but it's weird. We agree on almost everything. And frankly, I think that makes the podcast a little bit stronger because we're presenting kind of a united front on what we want to talk about, where there are multiple opinions. We share those. But if we really have a position on something, I think that having both of us agree, I think that 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 makes our topics a little bit more impactful. You know, it's funny, Tom, that you say that, because when I when it, back on, when I started Lawyer to Lawyer with Craig Williams way back when, we envisioned that we would always be on opposite sides of every issue, because Craig is <laughs> kind of a strident Republican, and I am not anything near that. And, you know, he was West Coast, and I was East Coast. We were supposed to somehow be opposites uh, on the same show, and we found the same thing. We tended to <laughs> we tended to agree all the time, and in a, fortunately, we'd have guests who didn't agree, so that would make it a little livelier. <laughs> you know, it feels weird, but in the end, I'm I'm satisfied. Before we move on to our next segment, let's take a quick commercial break. The legal industry is undergoing a fundamental transformation, and the Daily Matters podcast is here to give you a competitive edge. In Daily Matters, Clio CEO Jack Newton interviews prominent legal experts to explore the new normal for law firms and how you can succeed in a work-from-home world. To listen, visit clio.com forward slash daily or subscribe to Daily Matters wherever you get your podcasts. Now, more than ever, an effective marketing strategy is one of the most important things for your firm. 
Scorpion can help. With nearly 20 years of experience serving the legal industry, Scorpion has proven methods to help you get the high value cases you deserve. Join thousands of attorneys across the country who have turned to Scorpion for effective marketing and technology solutions. For a better way to grow your practice, visit scorpionlegal.com. Welcome back to the Digital Edge on the Legal Talk Network. Today, our subject is a legal podcast about legal podcasting. Our guests are Bob Ambrosi, Joe Patrice, and Tom Mile. Bob, those of us on this podcast, excepting me, who has a little tiny legal practice, are not in the private practice of law. Now, my company, Sensei Enterprises, actually does get a fair amount of business from our podcasts, from papers we write, and from the presentations we give. And we track that, of course, very carefully. But what is your sense about any marketing benefits of podcasting for lawyers? If, if, if a lawyer chooses to do a podcast and does it well, does that really result in new clients? You know, I, that's a difficult question, and I don't really know the answer to it. I, I mean, I, I find it hard to believe that a, a podcast is going to be a significant source of, of new clients for a, for a lawyer. You know, obviously, there are a lot of different kinds of podcasts out there. And I think lawyers who are doing podcasts about their particular area of law, focused on their area of law and focused on a specific audience, are going to bring in some business. If, if somebody were to ask me, what's the best use of my time in bringing in business? Is it podcasting or is it, say, blogging and speaking, uh, that sort of thing? I'd probably put podcasting at the bottom of that list. You know, part of the problem right now with podcasting is that there are, as, as was alluded to earlier, just so many of them out there right now. And so if you want to reach an audience and reach a, a wide audience, I'm not sure podcasting is the best way to go about that. Some some lawyers do, in fact, reach quite significant audiences with their podcasts, but it's a struggle to do that. I, I think, you know, start, start with something like blogging and speaking, then use podcasting to help maybe round that out. I mean, the advantage is it, it lets people hear you and hear your voice and hear your understanding of your topic. And, and it lets people consume you, if that's the right word, you know, in <laughs> in places when they otherwise couldn't, you know, when they are driving in their car or out walking or, or whatever. So there are those kinds of advantages to it. But I don't think I've ever actually talked to a lawyer who said, yes, I got a client through a podcast. Well, that's fascinating. I would put it at the bottom, but we have talked to people who who say they heard of us and then came to us because of podcasts, but I'd put it yeah. on the bottom too. Yeah, yeah. Well, Joe, we've seen many changes in the evolution of podcasting, and, and in recent months, lots of recorded Zoom video chats are posted mm -hmm. as podcast. So now that you can easily record a video, are audio podcasts still relevant and important? Well, I mean, I, I think definitely because who wants to look at all of us who haven't had haircuts in three months, right? <laughs> right. No, I, but I, I do think that they're, they're still important. I actually, weirdly, the and I started seeing this right before the quarantine came down. There were some podcasts that I listened to that started putting up video, but they weren't putting up video where they were like acting like television. It was just video of them hunkered over their microphones and recording a <laughs> podcast. And for some reason, people enjoy watching folks actively not trying to be a visual medium. I don't know why, but hey. Uh, so I think that that certainly appeals to some people. And I like the visual stuff. I mean, the work that we're doing, Bob and I and some others are doing on that weekly show, the Legal Tech Week show, is it's fun and it's nice to see each other and there's a community there. But I think more people, especially the way that podcasts are consumed while you're commuting, while you're driving, don't lend themselves so much to the video. So I think that video is another thing and another dimension that people can consume. But I don't think it makes the audio version any less relevant because of the way in which it's generally taken in by folks. Tom, even though our listeners are listening somehow, do you have any special tools or tips about the consuming of podcasts, how they should do it? 
I do. And, and you're right. I think everybody's listening to this somehow, but I find that not many people are using some of the more interesting tools that I think are out there. There's a bunch of standard ways like Apple Podcast app or Google Podcast app for those of you who are on iOS or Android. A lot of people who are on iOS are using Overcast. My personal favorite is Pocket Cast because it's available basically everywhere. I, I think there, there are so many different apps that you can download to consume podcasts. If you're a Spotify user, Spotify has recently made some pretty big moves in podcasting, purchasing some of the bigger podcasters out there. And uh, if you've got a Spotify account, you can listen to all the podcasts you want for the cost of your subscription. Um, there are some new interesting services that are out there that are looking to monetize and do different things with podcasting. One is called Luminary. That's a paywall for podcasts. You pay a monthly subscription fee. And I think that the benefit of Luminary is you don't have to listen to ads. You get to listen to podcasts, but I'm, I'm not totally sold on that model. There's a brand new service that just rolled out, I think probably in the last week or two, it's called Pod Hero, where you pay a subscription price and a percentage of that subscription goes to the creators of the podcast. So it's a little bit like Patreon, but you're paying this one service to distribute your subscription price to other people. My quick rules for finding a good podcast app, make sure that it's cross-platform so you can listen on any device you want, whether you've got an iPhone or an Android phone or a tablet you wanna to listen to or Android or Windows, whatever it is that you happen to listen to. I think another good feature to have is one that syncs across all devices so that you can stop listening on your phone and pick up on your laptop or other device right where you left off. And then I think that the ability to create your own filters and playlists is important rather than just have a list of the most recent podcasts in your feed. And, and some of those tools I mentioned have those capabilities. I think that it can be so much more powerful and you can have a, a much more enjoyable time of listening to them if you kind of take advantage of some of those features. There's an app that I, I use sometimes that has a unique feature I don't think I've seen on any other one, which is an ability to add bookmarks as you're listening to a podcast. Ah, yeah, so, really you know, cool. you're, you're like 10 minutes into it and somebody says something and you want to make sure to go back and note that later, you know, you're out on a walk or something. You just click a button and it adds a bookmark there. It's called Radio Public is the app. Uh, See, the, it's holy, cool the holy grail there would be to be able to take that clip and post it to your blog or to social media or to something <laughs> just for that little clip of whatever was important. And I'm waiting for the service that can do that. Well, there is... Um, there is one that it's a paid service. I, maybe you can only do it for your own podcasts. Uh, maybe not other people's podcasts. <laughs> ah, maybe but, so. um, we've been, we've you've played around with a little bit on Law Next. You can make you can make a little social media, uh, Twitter or, or Facebook clip, like a thirty second clip out of your podcast. Well, gentlemen, this has been a fascinating uh, set of interviews, and we knew this would go a little longer than our normal Digital Edge podcast. So let's end up with a lightning round. Here's one question for each of you to answer briefly: What's a must listen podcast? people need to check out right now and why? Bob? Well, I, I won't be, I was going to be self-serving and mention the Legal Tech Week one, which we've just started with Joe Patrice and, and Molly McDonough and a whole bunch of other people uh, doing a weekly uh, roundup of the week's news, but I won't mention that one. Instead, I'm going to mention... <laughs> <laughs> Very nicely done. Nicely done. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to mention uh, Daily Matters, this Clio podcast that since the sort of the pandemic thing, it, was, it existed before the pandemic, but Jack Newton, the CEO of, of Clio, has been doing a daily podcast where he's had on just a, a, a who's who of fascinating guests every day. And it's really, uh, really fun to listen to. Joe? Well, I will also not be self-serving and say thinking like a lawyer, the Jabot or the ATL COVID cast or any of the things that we do, because that would be wrong, too. So what I'll, what I'll say is I'm actually sad because uh, one of my actually my favorite podcast has been a victim of COVID-19, as it turns out, like they got laid off from the company they were at. So it's not around anymore. So that throws a loop for me. So I guess I'll have to drop down to my second favorite thing, which is. Out, completely outside of any of the business side stuff. Revolutions is a podcast that I've been listening to. It's a history podcast. The guy's podcast, yeah. really good and has been for years. So if people don't already listen to that, I, I'll hype it because I think it's a uniquely well done show. And Tom. All right. Since you guys have mentioned the Kennedy Mile Report several times, I will not mention it again. <laughs> instead, <laughs> ins instead, what I will do is I will, my recommendation is a podcast called Rabbit Hole. It's an eight episode series from a New York Times reporter, and it covers the idea that 
YouTube altering its algorithm to get people to watch what they think that they want to watch next has led to some pretty frightening things in our culture. And it is scary to see where people go and the stuff that's out there on YouTube. I think everybody needs to be aware that this stuff is going on and they do a very good job of reporting on it, whether alt-right, alt-left, QAnon, um, PewDiePie, or any of those things. It's a very sobering look at how YouTube works and how people are consumed by it. Fascinating. Well, thank you for joining us today, Bob, Joe, and Tom. Uh, you're all good friends, and we enjoy your podcasts. They're all marvelous. And, you know, the reason you guys got picked is because we really picked the people we admired most who were podcasting. So I, we know, of course, that you're you're very busy, but we appreciate the fact that you turned out to be court gestures as well. So <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a nice part of the experience. But we do thank all three of you for your time and for some of the invaluable advice that you've tendered to our listeners today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thanks a lot, yeah. Thank you. And that does it for this edition of the Digital Edge Lawyers and Technology. And remember, you can subscribe to all of the editions of this podcast at LegalTalkNetwork.com or on Apple Podcasts. And if you enjoyed our podcast, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye, Miss Sharon. Happy trails, cowboy. Thanks for listening to the Digital Edge. Produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join Sharon Nelson and Jim Calloway for their next podcast covering the latest topic related to lawyers and technology. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.